Welcome everyone to today's uh, Residents and Researchers panel discussion. My name is Amy Schultz and I am in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health and uh, co-lead the Community Engagement Core for the MLEAD Center. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to introduce uh, today's session. I wanna begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, the University of Michigan, as many of you know, originated from the sale of lands that were ceded by the Anishinaabe, um, the Fox, the Peoria, and the Wyandotte communities. Almost all property in the United States was obtained through unconscionable means and changes in land use that were unleashed in that process have led to profound, profound environmental changes with implications for life on earth. Understanding the history of genocide and settler colonialism that underlies the contemporary environmental health challenges and associated health inequities that we experience today can create a foundation for applying our research, our teaching, and our practice to create a more just and equitable future. The Researchers in Residence Lecture Series highlights researchers who are doing path-breaking environmental health science in conjunction with members of communities who are directly imp uh, impacted by the environmental health issues that they are studying. Today, I am really delighted to introduce our guest speakers, both of whom are actively working to understand, understand and address the environmental health challenges that were unleashed in Michigan in the 1970s when the Velsicol Corporation, located in St. Louis, Michigan, mixed up bags of animal feed supplement with a fire retardant, both of which were produced at that factory, and shipped those uh, the mixed up bags throughout the state where they eventually contaminated over 2 million farm animals and ultimately the people, the residents of the state of Michigan. At the time of the contamination, very little was known about the health impacts of those exposures other than the health effects that were experienced by farm families and their animals that were exposed to the, to the um, contaminated feed. We are so fortunate to be joined today by our presenters, Bonnie Havlicek, um, a nurse who is the co-chair of the PBB Advisory Board. She is retired as Director of Community Health and Education uh, at the Mid-Michigan District uh, Health Department and describes herself now as a retired a, tiree, a retiree who is a small farmer. We're delighted to have Bonnie with us today. She is joined by Dr. Michelle Marcus, a professor of environmental health and epidemiology at Emory University, who has been working for decades to understand the health impacts of the PBB contamination in Michigan. They will be speaking with us today on PBBs in Michigan, empowering an exposed community. Welcome, Michelle and Bonnie. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, I'm going to start out with a brief history of the PBB contamination and then move on forward to discussing how community partners are actively engaged in the research. And then Dr. Michelle Marcus will review her research findings and community engagement from the researcher's perspective. That's probably the only time that I use the term doctor. That's one thing about this collaboration. It's very different to actually know face-to-face -face the people who are doing the research in your community. And so to the people in our community, it's Michelle. It's not Dr. Marcus. Um, and so that's what uh, one of the things that makes this unique. Um, Michelle, if you can go on to the next slide, please. So uh, back in 1973, 74, um, I was a nursing student at the University of Michigan. And I spent my summers on my family's um, organic small hobby farm uh, where I milked our one Jersey cow and just had all summer long, we were using that rich cream 
um, making whipped cream on a strawberry shortcake, homemade ice cream every week. I remember hearing about the fire retardant um, PBB getting mixed up in the animal feed. And I'm ashamed to say I was not very sympathetic. I just could not understand how this could happen. How could anybody be so foolish as to let fire retardant get into the feed? Um, well, this is really how it happened. Michigan Chemical Company, also called Dulcicol, uh, located in St. Louis, Michigan, made a variety of chemicals, mineral supplements, and pesticides. They made a magnesium product that they called Nutramaster, um, that when it was added to cattle feed, improved productivity and milk production. They also made a fire retardant that they called Firemaster which was stored next to the Nutramaster, and they were both packaged in similar bags, similar looking bags. Um, they were both white powdery substances. Well, uh, the PBB fire retardant was accidentally shipped out to feed mills, and instead of the magnesium mineral supplement was mixed into the livestock feed over a period of months. Michiganders consumed the contaminated milk and meat. This mix-up continued and farmers began to see health issues in their herds. Milk production decreased, their animals developed malformations and extreme weight loss. Farmers were blamed for the maltreatment and were accused of maltreating their herds. And this was devastating to the farm families. Um, next slide, please. It was actually a very persistent farmer, Rick Halbert, who discovered that a fire retardant was actually in the feed and causing all the health problems that the farmers were noticing. And he was able to trace it back to the mix-up at Velsicol. Chemical residue in the feed mill machinery continued to contaminate not just cattle feed, but also pig feed, chicken feed. And again, this continued over months. Farms were quarantined, herds were destroyed, and families devastated. The state of Michigan began a study of PBB health effects. Blood and fat samples were taken from exposed families. This is the beginning of what we call the PBB registry. During this time, our family cow developed misshapen hooves. She became lame, very arthritic, a uh, very arthritic condition, and she wasn't able to walk. Um, veterinarians didn't know what were the, was the problem with her. So I know this sounds really harsh, but this is how farmers work. She ended up in our freezer. And so, and 18 months later, her calf, which she had raised, was butchered and also ended up in our freezer. And this was common for many families throughout the state, not just the big dairy herds, uh, where that contaminated feed somehow got onto the farms. And unknowingly, um, that meat and those products were consumed. Um, children were exposed in utero and through breastfeeding. And although I've talked I've talked to several women who were offered breast milk testing. I don't believe this was really a widespread practice. Next slide, please. Um, around 1990, the chemical workers were excluded from the PBB registry due to exposure to multiple chemicals. The chemical plant site was capped and sealed and became an EPA Superfund site. Now jump forward to, to about 2011, uh, when I was the Director of Community Health and Education at Mid-Michigan District Health Department. Our epidemiologist, Norm Keon, was a member of the Pine River Superfund Task Force, which was a very active group of citizens that over the years advocated for um, research and information on the Superfund um, site and uh, were involved in a variety of projects. 
And they became, he became aware of Emory's meetings with farm families. At uh, this time, Emory was just starting some community meetings with farm families. And he connected the health department with the Emory team. And we worked with the chemical workers who wanted to be included back into the research studies. Um, so Emory want, needed to do a small pilot project in order to get funding to continue research with the chemical workers. So um, we this actually started my involvement in the whole project. Um, we offered the facilities at the health department and actually ran a couple of clinics where we obtained the blood samples for on the chemical workers for the pilot project and um, made sure that they completed their health histories. When I heard the heart-wrenching stories of these chemical workers and St. Louis citizens, um, it, it, it just really affected me and, and helped me be committed to this project. One of the things that I was really proud about was making sure that those health histories were totally completed with a small sample pilot project of 20 individuals. I knew we had to have every single blood sample collected and properly submitted and every health history complete. And I was noticing that there was one question that they weren't answering. And the question was, have you fathered any children? And I'd say, well, why didn't you complete this question? And uh, the chemical workers would say, well, are they talking about my stepkids? I father my stepkids. I've got, you know, several relatives' kids and and other kids that I consider that I'm their father. Is that what you're talking about? And I said, Oh no, they're talking about your biological children. And then it was, Oh, okay. And that question was completed, and you know, is is what was true for them. Um. I found over the years, this is a very important uh, area where the citizens in the community give input to Emory University. We're asked about wording on letters and, uh, and grant applications. And we also often are saying, no, 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 reword this differently. It needs to say this, or this is important. We want this included. Um, so, uh, in fact, Emory then did with that pilot project, they received the funding from NIEHS and they were able to invite the chemical workers back into the registry and um, offer PPB testing to a wider range of citizens in Michigan. Uh, and that first testing that opportunity that we offered, it was amazing. Again, community partners, the city hall in St. Louis donated their site health department, we arranged phlebotomists and equipment to do the blood draws. And um, of course we said, yes, December is a, is a good time of year for, for families. Um, early December, it's a good time to come, but you might have weather and there was a blizzard. But we, in spite of that, we had, it was several hundred people, I believe Michelle, wasn't it, that, that showed up to have their blood tested that they wanted to participate. Yes. Um, okay, go ahead with the next slide. Um, so now talking about different community partners. Over the years, we've par partnered with the University of Michigan on the PBB to PFAS, um, the policy lessons from Michigan um, contaminants. Uh, on that conference, we also did a legislative lunch and learn. And so partnering with uh, universities allows us um, a wider audience and gives us more input into concerns and also makes this PBB contamination relevant to today. Next slide, please. Another part community partner is Central Michigan University. Um, they had a professor, um, Brittany Fem Fremian, who uh, was interested in doing the oral history project. And this is just an example of some of the statements that uh, came through with the interviews that were conducted of 68 individuals. Um, 
where you actually puts a human face on uh, what happened. Um, so, you know, it took 20 years to create a herd. And in one day, the whole herd was gone. Next slide, please. Um, and our other community partners, uh, the PBB Citizens Advisory Board is made up of primarily farm families, but also people that have discovered that they were exposed to BB, PBB through food sources. Um, and uh, uh, the, um, the co-chair, so myself and, and my co-chair meet monthly with the Emory, Emory team, along with representatives of the other community partners. Mid-Michigan District Health Department, which covers Clinton, Gratiot, and Montcalm County, um, also is an active partner. Um, the, the Pine River Citizen Superfund site, um, they also, they meet also monthly and are very involved. And the photo is of some of those citizens members um, at one of our regular meetings. Um, so what keeps me involved, and, and I hear this from participants, is by uh, the research actually gives meaning to this tragic event. Um, Sometimes people are looking for answers. Sometimes those questions are answered. Um, sometimes maybe not quite so well as what they wish. Uh, one frustration is to get the real time look at uh, the challenges of getting funding to do what they want to do. Um, sometimes the length of time it takes. So for example, when uh, they have their PBB test drawn, it's not an instant result. They have to wait for the lab to run those tests in batches. But it's personal. We get the, our PBB results back. We know what the research findings are. We know the researchers by name and we know their faces. We know who they are. Um, and that rela relationship is what makes this so valuable. In our clinical um, studies, our no-show rate is less than 10%. And in public health, in our WIC clinics, family planning clinics, we expected a no-show rate of 30%. So when people want to be involved and they want to participate, they keep their appointments, they're on time and they're there. And that dedication it to me is very impressive. Next slide. And this is my last slide. Um, but one thing that we have been thinking about as uh, citizens is when you look at this map, you can see, although it's uh, several years old, um, most of our participants are in those rural counties. Oakland, Macomb, um, Monroe, Monroe County, Genesee County have fewer participants than those rural counties. Um, really wondering, as you hear the rest of the presentation, do you really think, do you think maybe Detroit communities would be interested in joining? Would they benefit from being involved in the Michigan PBB research? Um, and so we are looking for more funding to be able to, to be more accessible to those communities. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and she's going to share some of the research findings and more about our relationship uh, with community partners. Great. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Uh, while I'm pulling up my slides, I just want to say, <laughs> you know, that uh, our partners in Michigan um, are, are more than, whoops, this is not working, are more than uh, research partners, uh, you know, their family. Uh, I have known uh, Bonnie for a long time. Uh, 
and some of the other partners uh, have stayed at my house. I have stayed at their house houses when we are in Michigan. Uh, you know, they've truly become family. So um, I got involved um, back in the mid 1990s um, when there was a concern about endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment. Um, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so at the time, uh, you know, there was a lot of evidence from wildlife, from uh, and secular trends in people. In wildlife, there were lots of reports of reduced fertility, feminization of male fish um, and reptiles, decreased immune function. And on the human side, um, there were trends indicating increased breast cancer, testicular cancer, girls were maturing earlier and boys were uh, increasingly uh, experiencing more uh, urinary and genital abnormalities. And um, I was um, working with um, uh, Dick Jackson, who was head of CDC's National Center for Environmental Health at the time. And he asked me to put together a, uh, a team of academic and CDC scientists uh, to basically, you know, explore the question, you know, is this a, uh, a public health threat, um, endocrine disruptors in the environment? And, um, <clears throat> you know, I thought about the folks exposed to PBB, um, which uh, based on toxicology um, is a lipophilic chemical uh, that does act as an estrogen. And uh, so, I got involved because I was concerned that the folks uh, in Michigan might be experiencing these same problems. And uh, I just wanna point out um, one of our partners here, uh, Tom Corbett, um, who was a, phys a practicing physician at the time and also uh, dabbled in toxicology. And he was concerned that uh, PBB because it's lipophilic, would be concentrated in breast milk because breast milk has a high fat content. And he went on a local TV show to say that women with high levels maybe should think twice about breastfeeding and got into a big argument <laughs> um, on that local show. Um, but he was thinking ahead. And in fact, um, one of the first things we looked at uh, when we got funding from NIEHS was to look at menarche in girls who were exposed in the womb and through breastfeeding. And um, if you look at this graph, the blue bars are the age at menarche of girls who were not breastfed. And uh, the yellow bars uh, show that uh, the group of girls who were born to mothers with high exposure and were breastfed, had their first menstrual period um, a full year uh, earlier than girls who were not breastfed and, uh, or girls with lower exposure. Um, and, you know, I, I presented this, uh, you know, at scientific conferences and, um, you know, a, a lot of people would say, oh, that's not a big deal. It's only a year earlier. Um, and then when I presented this to the community, um, you know, a woman came up to me and said that her daughter had her first menstrual period when she was five years old. And, you know, it just, hit me, you know, like right between the eyes. And, 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 and that was, you know, sort of this transformation of this, uh, you know, research participants to, you know, mothers and daughters and, and, uh, and, and you know, people who, who have really suffered. It's also an important lesson for researchers that um, when you sample from a population, uh, that you may miss the tales. This, this mother, daughter, uh, mother and daughter were not in our study. 
So we also, uh, because this was uh, an established cohort, we were able to follow those daughters to maturity and found that um, they were at increased risk of miscarriage based on their mother's serum level when she was pregnant with them. And here you see the high group and the, the numbers were small, so we weren't able to separate out the, um, those who were breastfed and those who were not. But if you pulled out um, the 25 girls who were uh, born to highly exposed moms and were breastfed, their rate of miscarriage was 35%. Um, uh, we also, oh, this didn't show up right. Okay, so we also looked at the boys who were exposed in the womb and found an increased risk of urinary and genital problems, just like the secular trends. And, um, and a young man um, spoke to me after a community meeting and said he had repeated urinary tract infections and he actually had a mild a uh, case of hypospadias where uh, the development of the urinary tract is um, a little bit um, anatomically um, off center anyway. And, and his doctor made fun of him uh, because of his repeated urinary tract infection. Oh, so this, yes. <laughs> so there's the publication and there's the comment. Um, we also found an increased risk of abnormal thyroid um, function. And, uh, and one of our partners has shared with us, us that he had symptoms for years uh, before her doc his doctor considered thyroid problems as the cause. And his years of suffering could have been avoided if the doctors knew his PBB level and the associated risks. And interestingly, um, he lived in the community uh, um, near the chemical plant, um, but his, his grandparents lived right across the street from the chemical plant, and uh, he used to play on uh, the grounds of the chemical plant and had quite high levels of PBB. So um, work that we've done and other um, researchers have found an increased risk in certain cancers, uh, particularly breast cancer, digestive system cancers, and lymphoma. And the World Health Organization and the US EPA have designated PBB as a probable human carcinogen. Um, in recent years, we've also tried to uh, understand the biological mechanism um, by which uh, PBB exerts uh, these effects. And we did find that the methylation patterns that were associated with PBB were um, mimicked estrogen. So in terms of the, the uh, regulation of hormone metabolism and hormone synthesis, it acts as a weak estrogen. Uh, we also found that uh, it increased uh, biological aging uh, based on a, a, a methylation clock. We've also looked at uh, metabolomics and found again that it's steroid hormone pathways that are affected, uh, immune function, as well as uh, neurotransmitters. Ah, and uh, it, we did a small study where we obtained semen samples and um, found that uh, out of uh, four imprint control regions, that one out of the four was hypomethylated um, and that was associated with PBB. So we have uh, met with uh, community all over Michigan. This just shows you some of our community meetings in, in different areas so that we could share what we have learned, uh, listen to uh, the stories of individuals and ask them what their priorities were, what, what would be important to them uh, for us to uh, propose. And all of this work is uh, the community partnership is pivotal. And I, I can't emphasize enough 
uh, to the researchers in the audience that uh, community partnership improves the science. The community members have knowledge about exposures um, and they ensure that the research will be relevant. I mean, like, why are we doing this work if it's not to help the people who have suffered this exposure. And as Bonnie explained, uh, you know, they help us with wording and communication um, and, and, and that's really critical. Uh, they've also, uh, our partners have assisted with the logistics of, uh, of the research and finding space for us. Um, they also know how to communicate within their communities. Um, and uh, this, um, this partnership um, really results in, in very dedicated participants. Uh, as, as Bonnie said, um, we have very few um, who drop out or don't keep their appointments. Um, they, they really care. And the other, the other thing that I think is uh, less uh, commented on is that community members have their own power. Um, and there have been many times where um, community partners have written letters uh, to their uh, elected representatives or to the state health department or uh, to anyone else um, that we needed cooperation from. And, and it was very effective. So um, as a result of, of these years of working and listening to the community, um, we got funding, um, a research to action grant, um, which if you're not familiar with, it, it's a specific mechanism where um, it is uh, a, an established partnership, an academic community partnership, and our studies that, that we proposed um, were those priorities from the community. So um, in recent years, we had tested over a thousand individuals and found that 60% of them still had elevated levels of PBB uh, 45, 40 years later. And so they've asked us, how can I get rid of the PBB in our body? And uh, so we uh, designed a randomized uh, trial, a placebo randomized trial of a nutritional intervention and, a, and a, uh, a nutritional aid in order to see if we could speed elimination of PBB. And uh, we have just completed that study and we'll be analyzing the data. We're in our last year of that grant. Um, and uh, another thing is that we talked in community meetings about the, um, the children of women who were exposed, who are exposed directly in the womb. Um, but many people have said um, it was their father who was exposed and yet they're experiencing the same health problems. So we have been doing a number of analyses looking at paternal exposure. And because we saw those um, impacts on epigenetics in the sperm, um, we are looking at multi-generational epigenetics. And finally, um, you know, my doctor doesn't know anything about PBB. I mentioned this before. And um, fortunately, we recently got funding. Us, uh, we partnered with a small business um, that does online learning. And uh, we got funded to do a continuing medical education, continuing education for healthcare providers, nurses and doctors entitled how endocrine disrupting chemicals act as uncontrolled medicines in your patients so that we can bring this knowledge to physicians and they can consider uh, what impact this exposure might have on their patients. We also um, are in the last year of an infrastructure grant where we've been able to consolidate 45 years of data into a data a database. Um, we have developed a participant portal so that individuals can access their own data. Um, we've developed a researcher portal, which would, should be coming online in the next month or so, because uh, we want to make sure that this data is accessible uh, to researchers to take 
full advantage of this 45 years of data and biospecimens. Um, we're also uh, updating, um, we're doing matches with the National Death Index and cancer registries to update the mortality and cancer uh, by PBB. Uh, this just shows you our biorepository. We've got over 20,000 uh, samples uh, that are accessible. And now um, we will be applying um, to this new mechanism, the U24, uh, to, and we have an opportunity to include the urban population. As Bonnie said, we have not reached out to those populations because we have, did not have the funding to do so. And um, we would um, work with existing and new community partners and scientists uh, to develop research that might benefit the community. So we are looking now for collaborators who would want to work with us. Um, and I say us, meaning the scientists and the, our community partners uh, to develop research ideas uh, that will benefit uh, those communities. And um, I just wanna mention the Emory team, uh, Melanie Pearson, who's Director of Community Engagement, and Matrisa Terrell, um, who safeguards our data and knows everything. <laughs> She's been with us for 20 years. Um, and, and also that, uh, in fact, a recent publication found that um, Black women residing in Detroit that nearly 90% had detectable PBB, and this is recent. And having been breastfed was also associated with higher B PBB. So um, uh, I, I need to acknowledge uh, NIEHS has provided uh, most of the funding for this and uh, that we have uh, received uh, supplementary funding from our centers, both the Hercules and the M. Leeds Center uh, to do the oral history project and to do the PBB to PFAS conferences. We recently got funding from uh, intramural from Emory University to do a nested case control study of breast cancer, looking at whether epigenetic changes are associated with uh, the PBB levels of breast cancer patients. Uh, our collaborators are many, many, many. I, I don't have time to mention um, all of the names, um, but again, I want to really emphasize our, uh, there's Bonnie for the Citizens Advisory Board and the Pine River Superfund Citizen Task Force. And they have been um, in existence um, for 25 years um, and uh, have been e extremely important partners as well as the, the Mid-Michigan District Health Department. So um, uh, that ends our presentation. I just wanna mention that uh, you can find more information on our website, uh, that our researcher portal should be coming soon so that you can explore what data and biospecimens are available. But if you are interested in exploring collaboration, uh, please let me know. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Bonnie, for um, a, a fast pass through a huge <laughs> amount of information spanning the last 50, 50 years, right? Today is the, this year is the 50th anniversary right. of the PBB contamination in Michigan. We really appreciate you sharing with us both, uh, Bonnie, your perspective as a resident, somebody who's lived through this uh, as a public health professional, but also someone who's very connected to farming um, and the agricultural community. And Michelle, your work um, as a researcher. We do have, we have a, just a little bit more than 10 minutes um, for questions. We I forgot to say at the beginning that we start this these sessions promptly at 12 and we and we will end at 1250. So we have just a little bit more than 10 minutes for discussion. Um, and we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to start. There are two that are kind of linked. Um, one is saying if cattle were slaughtered and dumped somewhere on the farm grounds and they were dumped 
other places too. Um, but the question is, is there a concern about groundwater contamination linked to the disposal of the um, of the animals that were slaughtered? And then kind of a linked question to that is, how can someone get their groundwater tested for PBB? Um, so I wonder if either or both of you would like to respond to that question about groundwater contamination. Yeah, so um, I'll start and Bonnie, you can add. Um, okay. So the two um, uh, major places where the cattle were buried were in Kalkaska and in Mayo. Um, and I know the Department of Natural Resources um, uh, has tested the water, um, you know, near those sites. Um, I'm not sure if they've tested recently, but they did not find PBB contamination in the water. Now, the important thing is that PBB mm. is not very water soluble. So it tends to bind to clay and soil and does not pass as freely into uh, groundwater like PFAS does. Bonnie, do you want to add to that? Am I correct? Didn't it um, go into the groundwater in St. Louis? They had to, in the last few years, um, totally tap into a new water system. Right. Um, so in St. Louis, mm -hmm. there was a huge amount of chemical leakage into the sediment of the river. Um, even though EPA had pulled, you know, like 18 feet of sediment out of the Pine River. Um, and it was found that the water from the Pine River was still contaminated with a really um, mostly breakdown uh, products of DDT uh, uh, synthesis. And, and as Bonnie said, they, they have a new water supply now. I think that's a very real concern for many farm families though, because mm -hmm. um, many of the farms disposed of the cattle on mm -hmm. their farm property. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are undocumented, unknown burial sites throughout the state and um, I don't, and probably not testing. Right, and I believe um, <laughs> that, uh, that you would need to get in touch with the Department of Natural Resources um, to ask about testing um, the water. Or maybe Eagle, I'm not sure, Bonnie. It's Bonnie. Eagle, Eagle is, our, is the former DEQ. Um, Eagle is right. the new name for the DEQ. The new name for the DEQ. So, and it sounds like, um, from what you're saying, it may also be relevant to have the soil tested um, in addition to, to potentially the water contamination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, yes. We're getting a lot of questions popping into the chat. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to move us on. Um, we have a, a question that uh, is coming from one of our research team and asking you to talk a little bit more about the nutritional intervention, um, what specific nutrients were used in the treatment group and the placebo, placebo group, and what is the biological mechanism involved. And I'm going to ask that maybe there be a if, if possible, a fairly succinct response to this question with further conversation potentially happening in another forum because we do have quite a few. I'm sure that question could take up the rest of our time. Um, so uh, Michelle, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, uh, so I'll just briefly say that we used an over-the-counter nutritional aid that inhibits some of the pancreatic enzymes that break down fat. And, uh, and the participants were on a low fat, uh, a lower fat diet, as well as some um, increase in exercise. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to um, anyone about this offline. Thank you, Michelle. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of interest um, in that particular um, question. We also have a question about how do people get, um, how would it be possible for people to have their own levels of PB, PBB tested in their bodies? Right, so right now, um, you know, our funding is ending. 
So um, this uh, we would have to propose in a, a new grant uh, that we're going to be submitting in February. And um, I should say that previously we did we've had we have a waiting list of hundreds of people who want to be tested. And uh, previously we put that in one of our applications to expand um, you know this testing uh, and the peer reviewers. Uh, didn't like it. Um, however, this new U24 mechanism specifically asks for um, expanding uh, uh, existing cohorts. So we have an opportunity to do that in this new submission. On our website too, um, you can, there's information on how to complete the health history and express an interest in having your blood tested so that you can at least be notified if funding becomes available. Thank you both. Uh, we have a question from someone who is a nurse. So Bonnie, this one may come to you. Well, who's, she's most, most uh, they have worked mostly in healthcare, um, but recently got their MPH and they want to stretch their legs in public health. And this area of research and other environmental health areas are very interesting. Um, and they're asking, what advice do you have to find and get involved in this kind of work? And I'm going to ask Bonnie maybe to take this one first, and then Michelle may have some additional thoughts. I think um, connecting, I, I would recommend connecting with your local health department and see if there are opportunities to volunteer or to attend um, meetings in your area of interest. Um, again, I would I'd certainly suggest uh, keeping an eye on the PBB registry site. Uh, for the next community meeting and attend and become involved in that. Um, and it, it's a great, fascinating area. Um, I really am look for job opportunity in public health and go for it. Once, once, once you do, I spent many years in critical care. And once I got into public health, it just really, that was it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Michelle, anything to add? Yeah, you know, um, if if uh, anyone is interested in getting involved um, with the the PBB cohort research, contact us. Yeah. <clears throat> The one thing I might add to, in addition to Bonnie's advice about reaching out to your local health department, in many communities, there are community groups that are actively organizing around environmental exposures mm -hmm. and environmental health issues, and there are often really important opportunities to get involved with that work. So take a look around your, your local community um, and, and you know get a sense of the lay of the land and who is working on those issues. Um, there are many, unfortunately, across the state of Michigan. A uh, couple more questions. I'll see if we can, we got two more minutes left. So let's see how many of these we can get through. The first one is my dad was exposed as a kid on the family farm. He refuses to be tested or even talk about PBB in parentheses, PTSD perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, the farm was quarantined and the cattle were taken to Talcaska. As his son, can or should I be tested or be part of the study? I. Yeah, some people don't want to know. They mm -hmm. don't want to talk about it. There's no pressure for them to be participate. We hear this quite often. But if you're at all interested, I'd really encourage that you be tested and become part of the uh, part of the PBB registry. So again, go to the web, PBB registry web page, complete the health health history online, and express your interest in participating. It just makes you feel like you're, for me anyway, made me feel like I was doing something um, and not just being a helpless victim of the tragedy. And, and let me also say that the only way we're going to answer that question about what the health consequences might be um, for uh, someone like yourself is if uh, you participate in, in the research. 
Um, we just had very limited um, information about offspring of fathers who were exposed. So in 60 seconds or less, my clinic was involved with seminal study about puberty milestones in the 1980s that showed earlier menarche in black girls. Currently there is reevaluation in this of this study in light of health equity thinking that urges looking at non-genetic causes. These PBB studies point towards a potentially co significant cause of these findings. How would urban black populations have been preferentially exposed compared to white or Hispanic urban populations? So we don't really know the answer to that, although there's lots of, of evidence that, uh, you know, that black urban populations are exposed to higher levels of endocrine disrupting chemicals in general. And uh, the only evidence, direct evidence that we have is uh, this recent uh, paper that I mentioned, looking at African-American women in Detroit. So that's one of the reasons um, that we would like to expand the cohort um, you know, for this very purpose and, and see um, whether the exposures uh, are in fact higher in, in Detroit residents, in, in African-American residents, and how that combines with perhaps other exposures uh, that they have um, that may be responsible for some of that uh, decline in agent menarche, some of that disparity um, in agent menarche. Thank you so much, you guys. And um, Bonnie, I wonder if you could add your final comments into the chat. Um, we have okay. reached our closing time and mm -hmm. just want to thank you both for your time, your commitment um, to all the years of work that's represented in this in this um, presentation um, and your time to talk with us today about this really critically important environmental exposure that has affected I think pretty much everyone who lives in Michigan um, and continues to do so. Uh, as we wrap up, I just wanna call folks attention to, Robin has put into the chat the link for the registry website that M Michelle and Bonnie have mentioned. If you're interested in getting onto the registry, please go to that link. And then just a quick announcement that the next Residents and Researchers webinar will be held October 11th. Our focus is water and public health, inequity and affordability. Um, Jackson, Mississippi has been hugely in the media recently because of their water affordability and access crisis. We have our own homegrown crises in both Detroit um, and Flint, as well as a couple of other uh, Michigan communities, and they are going to be highlighted um, in this panel. So please join us for that session. It will also be from 12 to 12.50 um, in, the, uh, in the afternoon. Thank you once again, Michelle and Bonnie, for your contributions to this fascinating conversation. And um, are you, if folks are interested in following up with you, could you very quickly potentially put your contacts into the chat? Um, sure. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Amy, always a pleasure. Thank you, Michelle.